obviously, with your great knowledge of English <coughs> history, if you could bring one English king from the past or queen to rule over us now and help fix the situation, which one would you choose? You see, I don't think that's the way to do it. We sorted out monarchs very sensibly, and we turned them into symbols. And that seems to me to be appropriate. I do not believe, although I happen to be an expert in Henry VIII, uh, I do not wish to restore the reign of Henry VIII. It's like trying to bring back medicine without anesthesia. It is not a good idea. Um, that, that what we learn to do is something very different. It's a notion of collective politics. I mean, if you go back, to, I was talking about the, all these senses being deeply entrenched in our history. If you go back to the 15th century, uh, if you, which I do all the time, of course, uh, like Jacob Rees-Mogg, you know, it's as yesterday. Um, if you go back to the 15th century and Sir John Fortescue, um, uh, the governance of England, Fortescue is perfectly clear that England England is not simply a monarchy. France is a monarchy. France is, a, is simply a regnum a dominium legale. It's an absolute monarchy. England is something different. It's called a regnum politicum et regale. It's a polity in which the king is indeed the central figure and the symbol of continuity, but he has to bear in mind that he is answerable. And Fortescue is perfectly clear that the people of England, and he's, he, he, he looks at this very interestingly. And again, you've noticed I haven't talked much about economics. And of course, modern Toryism has just disappeared up its own bottom um, uh, 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 as turning itself into free market economics, which is pure liberalism uh, rather than conservatism. But what is very interesting about Fortescue, when he compares England and France, and he knows France very well, he's lived there in exile, um, uh, after the, the fall of the, Langast uh, the Lancastrian dynasty um, with, uh, 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 in, in uh, 1460 um, with, 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 the, with the collapse of, 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 of the reign of, uh, of Henry VI. And he's in exile uh, until the re-adeption crisis when briefly Henry VI comes back only to uh, lose power again and, and, to be, uh, and to be murdered uh, in the tower. And so Fortescue has lived in France for nearly 10 years. He he is very familiar with France. He was acting as chancellor to the government in exile. He was also acting as tutor to the young, uh, to the young uh, Lancastrian Prince of Wales, to Prince Edward. And much of his work is written as an exposition for this boy. Um, the, and when he judges England and France, he judges them economically. He says the fruit of the absolutism of France is a government in which the, most of the subjects of the king are poor. They are subject to arbitrary taxation, they're subject to arbitrary law, they're subject to torture. And then he goes back across the channel, and by the way, the evidence is overwhelming. The, 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 the English peasantry, or they're ceasing, ceasing to be peasants in the 15th century, are spectacularly prosperous by European standards. And he uses the phrase taken from the, from the Bible, by their fruits ye shall know them. And uh, he points out that the entrenchment of property law in England, the fact that you can only tax with consent in Parliament, gives people a security of right of property, and that security leads to prosperity. And it seems to me that, 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 that we as conservatives should be more and more aware that conservatism is not just an epiphenomenon of the French Revolution. It's not just Burke reacting to the French Revolution. It is deeply entrenched in the history of Britain. We need again to be aware that conservatism is not a universal phenomenon. As a conservative, you do not believe that people and countries are the same. A conservatism in Britain is radically different from a conservatism in most of Europe. And we, have, we never had, uh, in the 19th century, we never had that high reactionary Toryism. There were gestures towards it in young England and all the rest of it. There's nothing of the sort that you will see with a Metternich or whatever. The English thought this was absurd. Um, so, no, it's not the king. It's us. It is... It is 
those of us who are interested in politics, which is presumably why we're all here. Forgive me, but I really do think it's very important to make that point. Very good. I ask a relevant question to the Minister of State. Oh dear, there's your chairman crushed. There, there's your chairman crushed, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for your very uh, enlightening talk. Um, you mentioned of the need to restructure society or political system. Do you have faith in the current government or Conservatives to actually tackle? No, uh, absolutely not. It's your task. It's your generation. There is, ne there is need for radical reappraisal. Um, it, it's both, it needs to be, but I think it needs to be both. Look, we have a choice. It is quite clear, is it not? Every opinion poll shows widespread discontent with the political process, increasing numbers of especially young people going in exactly the direction that you are and saying they would prefer you know, um, some form or another quasi absolute government, a distrust in the parliamentary process, a distrust in democracy. This seems to me to be absolutely catastrophic um, that there is a direct relationship, I think, between prosperity and a deeply unoriginal thing to say. I think there is a direct relationship, as Fortescue thought, between a measured political liberty and prosperity and the security of life, the security of property and all the vast intellectual developments as well that flow from that. But that, that what has happened is our politics has gone in, I think, terrible directions. I don't know whether you're looking, it's a very painful exercise, at the panel of wise men, which the Times has established to talk about elections. You know, uh, with, with Mandelson, Finkelstein and somebody else. Um, if you remember, uh, Finkel, Finkelstein is an able man, but this is the purely manipulative political science view that politics is just really about a little bit of manoeuvring in the centre, a tweak of an opinion poll here and another tweak of an opinion poll there and shifting marginal tax rates. This is, has run into the sand. There is a desperate... Is, uh, tell me, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you all think it's great and wonderful, and you know, Rishi is our best prime minister ever. But, but, but practically, what can we do going forward? Practically, what you can do is, first of all, you need to take, if, if you actually think something needs doing, you need to work out. You need, I mean, I've offered an idea. I've offered an idea which is very different. It is to say that, that our past actually offers a clue to what we should be doing. That, in other words, if you've had, I mean, let's put this as, if most of us, do we all call ourselves sort of, sort of conservative? Well, if you're conservative, you surely take the evidence of the past rather seriously, right? But you don't just think that, oh, you know, they're old fashioned. We've outgrown it we're going to do something different. If you, ha if you look at a constitution, the elements of which survive in at least outline unchanged for 800 years since Magna Carta, doesn't that suggest there's something rather good about it? That has actually resisted the horrors of the revolutions of the 90s. I mean, I don't know, there's, a, there's fashion, especially amongst the young, that wouldn't it be lovely to have a revolution? There is this clear sense that somehow we've, you know, that revolutions are all, all thrilling and exciting, you know, and isn't it terribly boring not to have had one? And by the way, the Marseillaise is so much jollier than God Save the King. And then you look at the words, you know, may the furrows run with the blood of the impure and all the rest of it. And perhaps you realize this may not be such a good thing after all. Um, um, but if I'm right, if we did have something that worked, that was capable, I mean, look what it was capable of, look at the scales of change that it was capable of embracing. It copes with the Reformation. Arguably, the greatest shift in consciousness I think you can have is between a, a Catholic and a Protestant country. I mean, it's a, an extraordinary dramatic change. It copes with industrialization. It copes with the rise of socialism and labor. All of them, it's capable of holding those things. And it seems to me we threw it away for a mess of pottage um, with Mandelson as a guru.
modern Italian one. Who created, who could effectively lead to the new restoration of control? No, I, I mean, you know, there are people like Jacob, who, who at least, Jacob Rees Mogg, um, who at least have some understanding of this. But, um, and, and I think it's a mistake, as it were, to, uh, again, to look around for this great leader. Um, there is surely a need of people of goodwill. Um, there is good, well, there is, we're, we're going to see, and I would have thought, a near collapse of the party next year. Um, there will be a radical clear out of central office. Its funding will be sharply cut back, which is a very good thing. Um, and it, there will need, to an extent, be to start from scratch. Now, there are two ways you do that. One is, you know, the typical way now is you simply reach down ideas, which in fact generally means, as I said, that you finish up with something that looks very much like a recently enfranchised ex-Soviet country. And you're an ex-Soviet satellite or whatever. The other is what I've suggested, but <laughs> there's no magic. There's there's nothing that we can just snap our fingers. I mean, if you look at great movements in politics, they do require leaders, but they also require particularly you, the young, dare one say it, to pull your fingers out and do things. Not to not to leave the public forum to what we've seen on the streets of London recently. Thank you. Um, OK, so shall we now open up questions from the audience? Um, does anyone have any questions? Maybe one or two of you who are interested in that. Original idea of this conference. The original idea of this conference is to convince you about the fact that you have a new idea. And I think a serious att attempt is being made to eradicate a more cinematical thing like in general. And I'm referring to traditional ideals such as patriotism and either uh, stoicism and even which I think many conservatives don't like to trust you. And I think this is leaving the younger generation directionless and is also sort of a gap between ratios. So to get my question, Dr. Fell. I mean, there, there have been extraordinary shifts of consciousness in earlier periods. I mean, for example, uh, one that we would all applaud in the 18th century. I mean, it's fashionable to decry Britain you know, as a slaving power in the 18th century. The most extraordinary thing is remember, <coughs> forgive me, <coughs> nobody thinks slavery is wrong. Hardly anybody. They, remember, there is no explicit condemnation of slavery in the Bible. Um, this is a complete misunderstanding, that if you look at the famous passage in St. Paul, he says that, that in God there is neither bond nor free, man nor woman, Greek nor Jew. Um, uh, in other words, that there is a kind of, uh, of leveling, but not here, but there. Um, yet, in the 18th century, this astonishing idea develops in England, against much national interest, that slavery is wrong. And uh, it seems to me to be astonishing, and it should be, rather than our getting excited about the fact there was slavery, which you know is a universal human phenomenon, it would be to look at why that happens. I've got a guess. I don't think it's to do with Christianity. I don't think it's, I mean, I, my own background is Quaker. I didn't, I mean, Quakers clearly were, were some of the very first to have these thoughts, but Quakers can't carry parliament or you know, they're not even represented in it at this point. I think it's something else. And why does the line, uh, Britons never, never shall be slaves, appear in rural Britannia? What are they thinking of when they make that point, Britain never, never shall be slaves? When's it, when is it written? When's it performed?
No, I don't. I mean, lots of people suggest this that there are, you know, there are subjects of the, 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 the there are the, the, there are Muslims, uh, slave, North African corsair raiding on Cornwall or whatever. I don't think that really penetrated the popular consciousness very much at all. The slaves are the French, the subjects of absolute monarchy. I mean, this is this, the, and I think it's this idea, and there's, there's a very powerful element of, of again going back to Fortescue, of the sense of freedom as being of the essence of being English, and I think it's this idea. Um, interestingly enough, it's Tories particularly who play with it, not 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 the Whigs, the the great Whigs, people like Beckford, uh, the people who lead the attack on George the Third and whatever, are the huge West Indian slave owners. If you don't believe me, go and look at their statues um, in in the Guildhall at Westminster. Listen to wonderful Samuel Johnson uh, when he says, you know, nobody yelps more loudly for liberty than the Yankee slave driver. I mean, absolutely, which which of course is the Roman. Rome is a culture in which you elevate freedom on the one hand and is based on slavery on the other. But the, something happens in 18th century England that universalizes. So yes, there have been enormous changes. I agree with you that the, the, uh, the, the whole business of um, uh, the counterculture, of postmodernism, or I mean, the, the whole caboodle, um, uh, of, 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 of identity, race, intersectionality, and whatever, represents, if it lasts, a change of values as revolutionary as Christianity within the Roman Empire. And indeed, it's a kind of, in, in, in one sense, it's a parody of Christianity. Um, you know, the, 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 the the, the, the Magnificat, uh, he shall put down the mighty from their seats and exalt them of low degree, is more or less what, at least its ideal aspect of woke, you know, white goes down, black comes up, you know, men go down, women come up, and, and you know, uh, uh, disabled go down, uh, disabled come up. Now, I happen to think that that revolution of values is a catastrophe. Um, and I don't, I would imagine most of you in this room agree with me. What we've seen recently are movements within conservatism, and I'm really pleased you asked this question. Movements within conservatism, like the Nat Con movement, and what happened last week. Are we familiar with the, um, the whatever it was called, the Association for Responsible Citizenship, the, 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 the Peterson, uh, uh, the kind of quasi-religious revival, you know, O2 inscribed with improving messages, just like a shopping center uh, or, or, um, or Billy Graham. Um, I find all of this profoundly depressing. And I do not think it answers to the British at all. We are the least religious of people. And I don't, I, I, you know, apart from a few, um, forgive me if some of you were there. I was going to say desperate young men. That's right, this is an awful thing to say. But, but And you will forgive me, please. It's, it's not intended. <laughs> okay, there we are. We can all joke. Let's joke. We're friends. We can all joke about these things and not get cross with each other. I just don't think that is the way to do it because it's not. Not political. What one's talking about is religious revival. What I'm trying to suggest is something that is practical. I would also say something else. The thing that has enabled these mad ideas, you know, I mean, can the, the protests that we've been seeing uh, in favor of Palestine, uh, of course, very much a part of this new world, um, uh, you realize that the reason why, uh, why, why there is such, why I think fundamentally there is such hostility to Israel is that this new set of values rejects the Holocaust as the moral plims plimsoll line. It does not, it do, uh, which is why the, the second, why they are entirely indifferent uh, to, um, to Armistice Day or whatever, uh, because they, of course, erect a new moral plim plimsoll line, which is generally speaking em imperialism and slavery. Um, uh, so the great problem is, I think, and I've said this before and I've been shot down for saying it, there is this jealousy of genocide. There is jealousy of, as it were, the Jews possession of, ge of, of, of genocide. So I think all this is, I think all of this um, is, is, is catastrophic. But how is it that these dreadful ideas have got hold in the way they have? I think it's fundamentally because of what New Labour did.
What, we've, what New Labour did was to create something outside Parliament and outside the electorate. Every time these ideas um, are tested in the public forum, you know, the, the idea that you can, become a, you can become a man or a woman simply because you say so, they're laughed out of court. But instead, we have created through the Quangos, through the Equal Opportunities Act, so through the Equality Act, and, and through the human rights legislation, we've created a machinery and a class which sustained them. What I would suggest, if we go back to the old constitution, you cut off at the knees the HR machinery, the Quango machinery, the kind of people who debank Nigel Farage, all of that gets cut off at the knees if you repeal the legislation of the new Labour government. It's a genuinely political solution to a broad cultural issue, which is what we should be doing as politicians. There is no point, there's no point in air, the, 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 the problem is we at the moment have a government that seems to have lost the notion that, le that real legislation works. Instead, you know, you have the absurdity of a conservative government. You know, banning, trying to ban smoking, I mean, yeah, yes. Trying to make maths compulsory, yes. You're abandoning the notion, which, which New Labour showed magnificently. I mean, I think everything they did they, was wrong, but they seized the levers of power, and they applied them. And the only hope for conservatism is if you identify those levers, you seize them, and you turn them back. I'm sorry, that's what conservatism means. I find you dated. Mm-hmm. I know. Yeah, yeah. The original Spiv, of course. Uh, we have Mrs. Thatcher fundamentally undermining by centralizing it, taking it out of the middle, claiming that she'd throw it back, back to the end of the And most importantly, we had a succession. Yes, Blair. Yes, Brown but also a stream of other conservative people flocking over to America, looking for inspiration, uh, which I surely do agree, with all of its links between the United States and Britain, is a very difficult uh, yeah. When we started to decide that what was more comparable for us was not in the Telegraph, but in the New York Times, we were in trouble. In my view, this sort of demolition that you're talking about, the demolition, wasn't done just by New Labour, they finished the job to some extent. It started with Heath, carried on with Thatcher, and you could run it back. Yes, I mean, I wouldn't, yeah, I mean, get, right, okay, I mean, what it seemed to me is that what Thatcher and Heath did was, apart from local government, the catastrophe of the units which people I'd identified with since Anglo Saxon England. The destruction of the counties. Um, that I would agree with. But the central constitution remained remarkably untouched. Um, and what New Labour did was to carry the demolition to the absolute heart. Thatcher dealt with the periphery. They did something much more radical, which was to attack the centre. I mean, we can broaden it out. I would go back even further. Um, the disaster of 1945. Um, again, why are we contemplating? Why is America contemplating? Why is the entire West contemplating the collapse of its currencies because of grotesque welfare provision? I mean, the, I mean if, you, if you actually look at where we are financially, um, it is utterly unsustainable. Do you all realize this? We are in a position where we are simply strangling economic activity. One cannot continue like this. Um, the, and also in Britain, again because of the Quango structure, the degree of gross mismanagement of the national debt. Um, we, we did insane things like sell inflation-linked uh, bonds at a time of zero interest rates. It's deranged. 
Um, the, 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 have, I, do any of you look at the financial pages? You really ought to. You're the ones who are going to be reaping the consequences. I'm a rich old bugger. It doesn't matter to me. But, but you know, you lot should really be looking at this seriously. Um, the, the tidal wave of debt which quantitative easing has created, because of course it was effectively denominated in two things. It was denominated in bonds whose value was collapsed because of, of soaring interest rates. Um, and it was denominated in something else. It was denominated in bank balances held by the Bank of England, which are suddenly now bearing interest. What is it? From 0.1% to 5%? 50 times what it was to begin with. 50 times. I mean, the, the, I, I, I find myself involved with, very briefly, an extraordinary man, um, and, and I've, now, I've now forgotten even the title of the book, and I've certainly forgotten his name. A, a rather good book on the collapse of the Roman Empire that identifies the moment uh, when it all falls to bits in terms of the coinage. Rome had, a co Rome had a highly stable coinage, an extremely elaborate structure of finance, so that uh, you didn't need to transmit gold coin or whatever. You could have, lo just as Britain with bills of exchange, long distance trade, and all the rest of it. And the whole thing falls to pieces in the reign of Caracalla because you double the wages of the Roman army overnight. And you, it's the equivalent of welfare. You suddenly create this unsustainable burden which the, the, neither the fiscal structure nor the economic structure could sustain. And I think, you know, um, so, so I'm afraid all sorts of things have gone wrong. I, mean, I just wanted to identify uh, the, the new labor business, particularly, as I said, because it was a central machinery. And I think it is particularly what has enabled the phenomenon you were talking about to move as quickly and radically as it's done. Um, uh, 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 why, you know, it's, it, it, and, and your point about the echoes of America is, of course, w again, why so much of woke is an, an essentially Anglosphere phenomenon, um, uh, with all the rest of the Anglosphere having broadly imitated uh, uh, the, the, these developments, particularly the Quanga. Um, which seems to me to be a uniquely damning and dangerous thing. Yeah. Loads of questions, yeah. Okay. I didn't catch, sorry, ancient ears, forgive me. Globalism. Well, I mean, again, <clears throat> in one sense, of course, we are to blame for it. The British Empire is the, is the, is the beginnings of a global economy. Uh, that's it's as simple as that, really. Um, uh, if you get if you get for the first time in human history um, a, 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 a military machine that is capable of sailing comfortably to and from Australia, so you. <laughs> Uh, so we create that. I mean, I think that the, the issue is not so much globalism as the, or in, you know, international trade or whatever, as its mindless idealization. Um, the, uh, the, uh, all, all, all the consequences of which, of course, uh, we are, we are uh, reaping very bitterly. Um, it's also clear, isn't it, that we are, we are going into very, very broad territory. I would see, I see two things. One of them is the, on the back of free trade and all the rest of it, the development of global trade from the, essentially from the 18th century onwards. But the other aspect of globalism, which I think is absolutely central, is the attempt at the reconstruction of international relations from 1945. And I would see, and I think we are now beginning to, this point is beginning to leap out to all of us, that the United Nations is at least as catastrophic as the League of Nations. And that the structures of the United Nations um, have, uh, have produced two things. They produced an absurd sense of the importance of the West, um, which you, know, you see at its greatest in, in, in the nonsense writings of Fukuyama. Um, uh, um, and on the other hand, in reality, what they did was to enable the values of the West to be inverted. Are you, are you familiar? I've, I can never remember whether he's called Jacob or Josef uh, Machangama. 
a remarkable book on freedom of speech, um, but, but with an astonishing article in which he shows how it is the Soviets and their satellites that take the, uh, the, the, the United Nations uh, uh, um, declar Declaration of Universal Human Rights, not to be confused with the European one. And, and they take the 10 years from the 60s to the 70s when it's changed from a declaration which is not legally binding to a convention which is legally binding to invert the very notion of human rights. That, that what happens in that is that the, the original intention of the universal human rights at the end of the Second World War was to protect in proper Anglo-Saxon fashion the individual against the state. Instead, through the operations of the Soviets, highlighting the alleged repressiveness of the West towards blacks and the empire, instead you turn it into the protection of minorities against majorities. And this is catastrophic, because the only thing that can do it is the state. So I think that we, we produced a false structure of international relations, whose hideous consequences we're seeing in Palestine. Um, uh, I'd thought, actually, of being really naughty this evening and talking about something else and giving you a talk that would have the headline, Give War a Chance. That the, 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 the abandonment of the notion of war is the only way in which you can resolve irreconcilable conflict. And the whole structure of the United Nations designed to stop that has produced, instead of, if you like, amputation, permanent abscess. Well, I was, I was highly active, indeed a leading member of the campaign led by Matthew Elliott um, against the alternative vote, the, 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 that, that first of the referenda. I now have a sort of vague sense of wouldn't it be love early to have a political system that would allow the development, as what we're seeing in Europe, is a revivification of politics brought about by the fact you can have groups like in Spain, in Italy, whatever, that would be conventionally regarded on the far end of the political spectrum, actually acting as a kind of yeast and revival. On the other hand, I am profoundly aware of how the need for our parties to be, indeed, fairly broad church coalitions, spared us horrors in the 19th and 20th, uh, and 20th century. So I'm conflicted on the subject. And I don't, think, I don't think simply the change of the electoral system is a panacea. I really don't. Um, the, 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 it, there is no shortcut to the kind of serious analysis which I've been trying to do and thinking back to foundations and thinking back to roots. Um, you know, there, there is this, dare one say, and I, I don't want to sound too harsh, but we live in a labor-saving age, and so there's a notion that there's the equivalent of a hack. You, know, you look in the Daily Mail, it's filled with hacks, the notion that there's a cheap, easy way, a shortcut. I don't think there is. I was brought up, um, the, the, we had a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful habit at Cambridge in my days of producing satirical biographies of our great teachers. So um, uh, Jack Plum's, uh, the, ti the title was a satire on the individual, and the title of Jack Plum's was, was Power and Impotence. Um, the title of Geoffrey Elton's was History and Hard Work, and I was brought up in the tradition of hard work. And I think, you know, one needs serious, Endeavour, serious thought. I mean, Toryism's been here before. You know, the, the Reform Act very nearly killed the Tory party and the split, over, the, the, the split over free trade and the Corn Laws. And you then get that imagine, brilliant imaginative reconstruction essentially by Disraeli. Um, 
Well, I suppose the whole of my career really was uh, was uh, designed to attack poor old Jeffrey Elton's Tudor revolution in government, uh, which seems to me to be an absurd idea. But I've sort of grown out of that. Um, and I do think that the reign of Henry VIII really does represent an extraordinarily watershed. Um, I began by talking about the importance of place and a sense of the reality. What the reign of Henry VIII does is to divide power and authority in England in a way in which it hadn't before. In the Middle Ages, um, all the functions of the state, and the state is a very awkward word to use, were concentrated in a single place. They were all concentrated in the Palace of Westminster and the Abbey next to it. Um, within the palace, the king actually lived. Um, it was also the place where the law courts met. It was the place where the exchequer, uh, everything. So the court, uh, the formal operations of law, and above all, parliament, all meet in the same place. What the reign of Henry VIII sees is a bifurcation, is a separation. Westminster ceases to the Palace of Westminster, cease, which is only the present Houses of Parliament, ceases to be the place where the king lives. And instead, first he goes off because it burns out, the private section of the palace burns out. And instead, he goes off and he lives first in Greenwich and he commutes. It's far easier to commute in 16th century than it is now if you're rich enough. You know, you've got a boat that just takes you up and down. King can get to London in 30 minutes from Greenwich. You try getting to Greenwich, London, 30 minutes even with the Elizabeth line you know, when it's working. Um, but he, he was able to do that. Um, um, and then once Cardinal Wolsey has fallen, you acquire his great town palace that we know as Whitehall, and you construct a new, huge, separate royal palace on the site of what is now the administrative district of London, centering on the Ministry of Defence and Downing Street. Now, why does this matter? It matters because uh, the changes introduced by Cromwell, Wolsey, and Henry VIII together, all of them working together, do something very remarkable. They leave, on the one hand, Parliament, the law courts, um, uh, 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 still in the Palace of West and the Exchequer, still in the Palace of Westminster, all of them having the symbol of the royal coat of arms or the crown, but with the king never going there. Instead, you have the monarchy as a symbol of the right way of doing things. On the other hand, you create the new instruments of Tudor power, the actual royal instruments of power, an in incredibly intensified court, the Privy Council, and the secretaryship, all of which are based in Whitehall. And there, they are the instruments of the real will of the actual monarch. And what I think from the reign of Henry VIII onwards is you have this tension between the, re it's always there in monarchy, between the real will of the monarch and the monarch as the symbol, as he is now, and nothing more, of continuity and the right way of doing things. And I think it's that tension between the two palaces, you know, this is really big, bold, um, uh, you know, history as fiction stuff. That is the real source of the Civil War. That, that you, you create that tension. And um, again, it's one of the things which, which you know, I, I was singing the hymn of praise to the historic constitution. It undergoes violent shifts. Of course it does. And the remarkable thing is that tension between Whitehall and Westminster is only solved not even by, uh, not even by the, the glorious revolution of 1689, it's only solved by the creation of the office of prime minister. It is the office of prime minister, as I said, which controls parliament on behalf of the monarch and the monarch on behalf of parliament which is why that office is so important and why the disastrous succession of occupants of it has been so you know, desperate for our polity. Uh, yes, OK. One more question. Well, we can, yeah, we have time. Oh, two yeah. questions. Yeah, two. So I mean, okay, you two, yeah. the last two questions. Here yeah, we go. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just uh, reviewed the Tudor Exchequer Act. Yeah, yeah. I know you wrote a very long chapter 
So uh, what's that? What's that? The input from Ian. Was there any input from Ian? Yeah. No, absolutely not. Uh, I never let anybody tell me what to write. I mean, the thing that's unusual about my television programs is I don't simply recite what's on auto cue. Uh, when I began, I had directors who were completely incapable of understanding that there were presenters who were capable of having a thought. Um, you know, most of the great names on television are merely articulated Wikipedia. They are merely read, reading auto cue scripts. I would never do that. Um, and um, you know, again, it was uh, there were many tensions in my own relationship with Jeffrey Elton. But that that insistence that you do the work, that you go to the sources, that you think about it. Um, which is what I'm really saying you've got to do. So it is hard work, but it's immensely satisfying and immensely creative. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. You see, I do, I'm not sure that the, this notion that the Prime Minister's chat with the monarch is really all that important. Um, I think that the essential role of the monarch is it is symbolic. And people then say, oh, it's just symbolic. Symbols matter. We can't survive without them. We think naturally symbolically. And that... Again, there's been a terrible, I think there's been a dreadful failure uh, since the last time anybody thought seriously about monarchy was George V. It's very hard to believe, but, but the, uh, particularly in 1917, you reconstruct a monarchy for early democracy. And you do it astonishingly effectively. You know, do we all realize the changes that happen very tightly, again, very extensively discussed in Crown and Country, the changes, and, and I think they're, they're, I think they're uh, talked about well by Simon Heffer in, in the volume that uh, you mentioned, the, the Ian Dale volume, um, that, that what happens in 1917 is extraordinary. Remember, 1917 is obviously the year of the Russian Revolution. Remember, the Tsar is George's first cousin. The, the, king, the British King Emperor's first cousin, they're indistinguishable. You look at them, they're, pretty, they're linked through the Danish royal house, um, and, and they, they look absolutely identical. And George V is smitten to the heart by the fall of the Tsarist monarchy. And uh, that doesn't mean that he protects the Tsar, quite the opposite. Um, he takes the view that rescuing the Tsar will be jolly bad for the British monarchy and so tough for the Tsar. It's not, it's not Lloyd George who abandons the Tsar to his fate. It's very definitely George V. And that, is, that was established by Kenneth Rose quite a few years ago. But what George does in reaction to it is literally reconstruct monarchy for democracy. Um, he, first of all, nationalizes the monarchy. Um, up to that point, uh, it's essentially a German dynasty. Uh, each generation marries back to Germany. I mean, in other words, dare one say it, the monarchy behaves rather like a Bangladeshi immigrant now. So you constantly remain foreign because you marry back home. No, but you ma you know, if you marry back home every generation, how can it be anything else? I mean, sorry, how can it be anything else? I mean, Edward VII speaks with a German accent. His first language is German. Victorian Albert, Victorian Albert governed the British Empire in German. You know, we really do need to remember this. This is not, I am not, I am not, not being in the least xenophobic or whatever. One is just describing what actually happened. Um, the, the great change is George V. And what George V does, of course, is literally, we're talking about symbols, he renames the dynasty. 
renames it the House of Windsor from Saxe Corbett Gotha, which famously produces the only joke told by the Kaiser, you know, which was that he looked forward to a performance of Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Saxe Corbett Gotha after you've chosen Windsor as the name of the royal house. And you know, they did market testing for the name. Um, uh, you, it's, 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 it's a brilliant choice. You not only do that, you alter the marriage rules of the royal house. Up to that point, you had to marry a German because the, the, the royal house maintained the rules of Germany, which was the rule of dérogence. And you could only inherit if you married an equal of rank. So you had to marry at least a serene highness. Um, and that, that pattern, can, you, uh, uh, George announces in an ordering council that the, the members of the royal house are able to marry English men and English women, which of course completely transforms royal marriages. You can present them as romance. You you have the extra you, you the the first the first people's princess is not Princess Diana it's it's the Princess Royal Princess Mary uh, who marries Earl Lassells um, in the first royal wedding held in Westminster Abbey since the Middle Ages the the, the 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 earlier royal weddings are all private ceremonies usually held in the evening in the Chapel Royal at St James's so you completely invert the nature of the royal family and then finally you completely re invent the honor system. You know, the garter has 24. The order of the the bath, I think, has 24 and then 48. Uh, and then there, there are things like like um, what, 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 whatever is the one, something or another, St. George, um, the, the funny diplomatic ones. Um, uh, what you do in 1917, on the model of the, the Légion d'honneur, you create the order of the British Empire, which is designed to reward thousands. Uh, you also create something even more remarkable. You create the Companions of Honour, specifically to honour trade unionists and socialists. It's extraordinary. That, that is actually the, the specified purpose of the Companion of Honour. And do you know where the first inauguration of the Order of the British Empire is held? Ibrox Park Football Stadium. And the star of the show is a little girl um, who was a munitions worker. In 1917, was a munitions worker. And if the women here will forgive me, you know, Edwardian ladies were like this with very, very tight belts. And the, the British Empire medal had to be pinned, I think, to the left breast. And the king had been let loose without Queen Mary and was observed to spend an inordinately long time attaching the, the medal to, to this very pert young lady's um, you know, left, left breast or whatever. So of course the crowd goes wild. It's you bring in a dying VC, dying dying on a stretcher to receive the VC. You know, we th we think that we've got a populist monarchy now. Imagine it. 1917. Um, and so it is, uh, and this is the moment at which your monarchy consciously embraces a new democracy. And royal ceremonies, all the ceremonies that we've seen, that we saw today, the ceremony of the coronation, the current ceremony of the Queen's funeral, is really a reinvention of the late 19th, early 20th century to put on a good show in front of the people. Earlier royal ceremony is aristocratic ceremony. Now, none of you are at a real university, but if you were at Oxford or Cambridge, you would know that academic ceremony should be as shabby as possible. You go around with your gown like that to show you do it, but you don't take it seriously. This is the nature of, of, of uh, aristocratic ceremony. If you're doing it in front of an audience that doesn't understand, i.e. the common people, you've got to do it properly. So the uh, earlier coronations are total shambles. Victoria's coronation, you do that service without recording it, uh, sorry, without rehearsing it. Um, uh, they get the ring the wrong size. They try to put it on the wrong finger. The queen is nearly screaming with pain as the senile Archbishop of Canterbury heaves it. It's been measured for her little finger. He heaves it onto her fourth finger. Um, the, and the taking of homage, Baron Roll takes it at such a trot, he trips and rolls backwards and gets, and this is, this is 1837, it's still the Regency. Nowadays we talk, oh, the Regency goes, wow. And then he gets up and he takes it again, at which point they open a book as to whether he's actually going to make it this time. He rolls back down again and makes it only at the third time when the Queen and her ladies rescue you know, and it's then explained to appalled ambassadors that this is an ancient ceremony. He holds the barony of Roll by rolling down the stairs. 
But you can only do that when everybody understands, when it's conniving, when it's performed in front of you know, this new demanding audience, the people, you'd require something very radically different. And we haven't had a rethink. And you know, the, the, the signs of the king of a kind of eco, -cons, you know, eco semi woke monarchy just seems to me not to wash it at all. And of course, to raise some very fundamental questions about relations with the actual, as both wokery and, and um, uh, uh, the whole business of the, the costs of climate change are going to become huge political, hugely divisive political issues. Um, I think that's all we've got time for today. I think we've all learned an enormous amount more about um, politics and history. And um, if we could all give Dave one more round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>